lecture hall of the math department at SFU where I used to be, we had a blackboard that it wasn't quite in its little track properly. And so if you did it wrong, it would come out. And then, then so every technology can fail. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, I suppose I'm a little off topic as usual, but I hope you'll find this interesting and it's very concrete. So I um, you should be able to hopefully follow it. I, and I, I want to start out just a little bit with maybe you would say motivation or maybe a more it's just sort of set up, but sort of. Uh, um, yeah, sure, so. And to keep things simple, I want to start with rooted trees. Um, so. Um, but you should be thinking of these rooted trees in the same spirit of rooted trees as the, in the Conchrime or Hopf algebra, in that you should be thinking of them as showing the divergence structure of Feynman diagrams. So as uh, divergence structure of Feynman diagrams. Of course, what makes rooted trees such nice objects from a combinatorial perspective is their recursive decomposition into their root and their children. Um, and so you can tell from the notation somebody uses their academic heritage. And I'm going to call that operation B plus. So we have B plus, which will take a family, a forest of trees, and it makes a new tree that looks like this. All right? And so now what do I want to do with this? I want to build some classes of trees um, by, you could say, a combinatorial specification, or you could say a combinatorial Dyson Schwinger equation, because at least in their common overlap, they're the same thing. Um, and I'm sure people in the audience all have their own favorite way of thinking about these sorts of uh, generating classes of objects in this sort of a way. So build classes of trees by specifications. slash combinatorial Dyson Schwinger equations. And so for example, what's one that I like to do? Here's a nice, easy one. Um, if you come from the pure combinatorics perspective, then some of my conventions are a little bit odd. They're to make them line up a little more closely uh, with what might happen on the uh, Dyson Schwinger situation, but it's just a change of convention. It's not really very exciting. Um, I might want to say something like this. All right, and um, at, at the risk of boring you guys who have thought about this a lot, let's go through this example slowly to make sure that we're all on the same page with it. All right, so. What do I want to think about this? This is, uh, there's a t of x here, uh, a t of x here. And I want to think of this as recursively defining t of x. Now, where is t of x going to live? There's an x here, and I want to think of that as a, a, a parameter, like a, a, sorry, a, a formal indeterminant, so my parameter for some power series, some formal power series. Um, but I have put the b plus here. Where is b plus? It takes trees and it gives a tree. So this is going to be a formal power series uh, with coefficients, say, in the Kuhn-Kramer Hopf algebra. It's probably the best way to think about it, right? Um, I want to think of this as sort of an augmented generating function, because then if I evaluated each coefficient just by putting one everywhere you see a tree, then you'd get an ordinary generating function. If I evaluate it at one oversized factorial, I get an exponential generating function. And if I instead evaluate with the Feynman rules, then I'll get a Dyson Schwinger equation. And so um, it's a, you know, a simple framework, but one that I like for describing this sort of thing. Anyway, let's actually work out the first few terms of this so that we see what's going on. So if I want to expand the example, what can we do? Well, t of x is going to start 1. All right, that's fine. I better tell you what 1 is. 1 is just uh, my notation for the empty tree. 
But if you're thinking concrimer, it really is just the one in, the, in your underlying field or ring or whatever you're working over. And uh, might as well be Q for me. It doesn't really matter very much. OK, then what's going to happen? OK, well, if I have 1 over 1, that's clearly just 1. And I'll take a B plus of 1. That's going to be the tree with just one vertex. And it has weight x, because x is our counting variable, counting the number of vertices in the tree. All right, now what's going to happen next? I don't really have that minus sign yet. Um, so I have 1 minus x dot. And so I got 1 over 1 minus x. Oh, well, that's just a geometric series. I know how to expand geometric series. OK, so that is, there's still there's 1. And now there's a plus x dot and a plus x squared product of dots, and so on. I'm just, whenever I write this, I really just mean as um, a formal expansion. So then what's going to happen next? Well, the x squared term, you'd have to have x in here. So that's just dot. And so you're going to take b plus of dot. And that's just this guy. And now what's going to happen on the next term? So I've expanded this as a geometric series, this whole thing here, down here. Um, so how can I get an x squared term in order to get a cubed once I put on one more x? Well, I could have this squared. That's two separate dots. Uh, cubed. And that would give me this guy. Or I could have this guy, which could give me this guy. All right. I better do one more term. Um, so keeps going. And then the one thing you might wonder is what the heck about what's going to go happen with this guy. Now, I'm going to view my trees as not having any order structure at the vertices, in which case I get this tree twice. Because it's coming from the cross term here, this times this or this times this. So if you want, you can keep the planar structure, but it's not going to be useful for me. So I'm going to leave it alone and write it like that with a coefficient. All right? Are there any questions about the way this sort of a setup works before we go on and do stuff with it? The coefficient of x n contains all the trees of these n vertices or not? Yes, that's what it's doing. Yes, that's, that's what it's, that's, but that's because this is giving us, um, if you, because I'm thinking of expanding this as a series, I can have any number of children there. And so that's why we're, we do, in fact, get all of the trees with this particular equation. Any other comments or questions? All right. Let's go do something with this. So well, what do I want to do? I want to now build more physical. Well, you could think of them as section Schwinger equations. Um, which are now going to be functional equations, not for this augmented generating function, but functional equations for the Green's function of something that you maybe want um, physically. So, which are some functional equations for Green's functions in quantum field theory. And how am I going to do that? So I want to have some Feynman rules. These are Feynman rules. And I'm just going to say that when I apply the Feynman rules to this whatever set of trees I have, well, of course, there's a lot of things I would have to define. I have to make choices and say, OK, well, what are actually these vertices uh, in my tree? What, what graphs do they represent? And uh, you know, I probably have more than one kind of uh, vertex for different uh, primitives at different loop orders. And there's a lot of little details that I'm not going to talk about because I want to show you the central story. Um, but in the end, you get some Green's function. Um, I'm always going to be working in a single scale situation. So there's only one kinematic parameter, which is corresponding basically to the log of the momentum flowing through the diagram. Um, and x, which before was our counting variable, has essentially become the coupling constant. OK, so it's a single scale. Um, x became the, coupling, became the coupling constant. OK, well, that's sort of, I didn't tell you all the details to make that very exciting, but something happens. Great. Um, 
And what I want to spend the rest of this talk telling you about is a little story about some fellows in this form and how we can uh, learn some things about them using chord diagrams and using bridgeless snaps. So let's actually put this up and start working on the next board. Can I ask a question? Please? Yes. Um, so when we're doing this on that final diagrams, we need to regulate the infinities, and the hop algebra tells us how to do that. Yes. Combinatorics, so you never see infinity. So uh, the hop algebra of renormalization. It's not so important to um, it, it is and it isn't. So first of all, um, when I set them up, if you set them up with Dyson Schwinger equations in this kind of a way, um, as if you renormalize the outermost divergence by subtraction, then the rest is dealt with recursively. So that's the way I like to think about renormalization, at least in this context. Um, so maybe that's not particularly combinatorial, but it, it's in there, it's in this framework, and that's the way I, I want to deal with renormalization for myself. Um, also, slightly relatedly, I'm not going to directly deal with the Kahn-Kramer Hopf algebra. I've mentioned it a couple of times, but it does underlie a lot of these things. I mean, why is B plus so important? Well, it has something to do with the Huxley cohomology. You know what? All, all of these things are related, even though I don't personally need it, so I don't want to introduce extra machinery that I don't personally need, but it is in there and it's part of this story. Other questions or comments? All right, so if you found that too vague or if you just don't like that kind of thing, now let me set up from this context a particular, well, I'm actually going to tell you the punchline right away. I'm going to tell you, or part of the punchline right away, I'm going to tell you how you can solve, not really solve, solve a series of expansions, certain Dyson Schwinger equations using chord diagrams, and I'm going to tell you that right now um, before I even give you all the definitions. So here's, these are, these are going to be the two examples that run through the whole thing. This first equation, let's just call it star. It's actually that one, but I want to copy it over, so this is all in one place. OK, so that's a reasonable equation. But I can also generalize it, and I want to write this way. So what is this? It looks like this. So now I'm in a situation where I don't just have one B plus, I have a bunch of different B pluses indexed by some uh, positive integer. And you want to think about this as your vertex is weighted by K, or equivalently, it's really a K loop primitive. And then what am I going to put in here? Well, instead of just a 1 over T of X, it, the uh, number of insertion places should really be growing with k, and I want it to be growing in this kind of a way, all right? So s is a parameter that comes, so this is really sort of double star sub s, uh, and then you build um, something like that. This would also be generating a class of trees in exactly the same way. Now I'm generating all trees that have uh, vertices of every weight from one you know, arbitrary weight beginning at one. Um, and the multiplicities I'm going to get are going to be dependent on my choice of S. All right? Now, what are we going to say about these? So we, uh, oh yeah, before I give you the solutions, I, I want to say what happens after you apply some Feynman rules. So with some work, which I'm not going to show you because it's a different story, you can ask me or look it up somewhere else. You can write what happens at the level of the Green's function in the following way, which is, well, maybe a little peculiar, but I actually quite like it. So now, depending on your background, you might look at this, this particular thing. What is this? This is a, I want to think of it as a formal power series in two variables. And for one of the variables, I've plugged in a differential operator. And now, depending on your background, you might say, Ugh. right? Now, if, if your background like me is more combinatorial, you're like, well, I, if formal, I'm going to deal with this all at a formal level, and it doesn't matter, right? If I want to think about this out some finite distance in the series, I only need some finite amount of this, and so I'm perfectly happy. If you want to think about it analytically, though, this is, uh, I, at best, a pseudo-differential operator. And so there are some things that you're going to need to think about. But I'm only going to tell you how to solve this equation formally, so we're all right. Um, but there are definitely some interesting questions you might want to ask about there. OK, so you get this. What is f of rho? Well, 
For me today, f of rho is just another power series. Except I'm lying because it actually is going to have a pole. Um, but all right, fine. It's just a simple pole. That's sort of boring. And similarly, with the same work, you can write this one like this. You're going to get exactly the same sum. And then there's now there's a bunch of them. Instead of just one F, there's a bunch of Fs. And I'm going to index them now, a changing letter, just to help us keep track later on. This is now going to be double indexed. So this is k0 over rho. And then there's an a k1, et cetera. OK. What the heck is all this? That looks like garbage. And when I try to publish in pure combinatorial externals, that's what they say. Um, <laughs> but what is it trying to say physically? Well, you have to imagine you take this, you apply the Feynman rules. What is the B plus? The B plus is the integral for the outermost divergence. So this is going to be some integral equation, where here you're now going to have the GXL, and inside you're going to have GX, well, not L, but applied to the momentum of the edge that you're inserting into, or the propagator that you're inserting into. OK, but then you can play around. You say, I don't really want all those things, so um, I'm going to convert all the, the logarithms into derivatives of powers, and then I'm going to manipulate everything around. And with some work, you get something like this. And what is f of rho? f of rho is the Feynman integral just for the primitive graph. And the rho here is that I'm, I reg I'm regularizing it just by raising the one propagator we're inserting into uh, to some power. So yes, we're doing single insertion plays. It's all still rather special in a, in a physics sense. Um, but that's how you should think of these. These are the expansions of the integrals of whatever primitives are contributing to your Dyson-Schwinger equation. All right? So just one in this simple first case we're working with, and a family one indexed for one in front for each loop order in this case. All right? But now you can also take off your physics hat and put back on the kind of mathematician that, um, that David was mocking, the one who just writes something down, and you try to solve it. Because there's a purely combinatorial problem just here on this side of the board. Because you can say, all right, let's suppose these guys are known. Because physics gave them to me. And I don't know what they are, but there's something. And physics gave them to me. And you say, OK, and I've got this relationship. But what I really want to know is the g of xl, that's some bivariate formal power series. And I would like to know how to write the coefficients of g of xl in terms of the fi's. Or in this more general case, I would like to know how to write the coefficients of this g of xl in terms of these a ki's. And well, in principle, you can do that. It's recursively defined. If you think a little bit about the powers of the various things going on, you can see that, yes, it will work. You can you know, just compute it recursively. But I don't want to do that. I want to actually understand these things. So I want to be able to compute it. Well, I, I'm not maybe personally so much computing. I want to understand it. I'm not going to understand it analytically. That's interesting, but that's not the game I want to tell you today. I want to understand it in the sense that I want to give a solution as an expansion that's indexed by some sort of nice combinatorial object, and where the contribution of each object is something straightforward in terms of these coefficients. Now, we already have one expansion in terms of combinatorial objects. I can expand in terms of Feynman diagrams. But then each diagram is contributing something really difficult, right? If I'm in integrals, they're really hard. So I want something where each thing, each combinatorial object, is going to contribute something easy. And all right, for these cases, I can do that. The first one's already kind of old. The second one is a little bit old, a few, good few years old now. Um, and then after I tell you that, I'm going to tell you some of the consequences we can get from that. Uh, that our more recent work uh, about this. And I'm putting that one at the very top because I want to leave it there so that we can look back at that equation anytime we need it. All right? Are there questions about this aspect of the setup? 
No? All right. Let me tell you the solutions then. And then I'll have to define a bunch of stuff. Ooh. OK. So this is a combinatorial problem now. And here's the solution. I don't mean to the exclusion of being an analytic problem, but that's one way of interpreting that. OK, and here is the answer solution for star. And this is work from now quite a few years ago with Nicolas Marie. And it looks like this. And this is going to be a sum. I will tell you what it's a sum over in a second. It's a sum over the chord diagrams. There's a big product uh, of, the, of different Fs. So um, what should I say here? So where sum is over rooted connected chord diagrams, um, and there's certain special chords that I'm going to call terminal chords, and the first one is called BC and is also called T1, which is less than T2, etc., less than TL, are terminal chords. Okay, but at this stage, what you want to think about is this is each chord diagram here. Well, for a given power of L, a chord diagram is just contributing a monomial. All right, the monomial is a little bit of a mess to write down, so that's that's kind of a notation issue. It's just sort of messy, but uh, each chord diagram has this monomial associated to it. Most of the monomial stays the same regardless of the power of L, but one piece of it shifts with L. All right, okay, that's not too bad. Is it possible to give an example of a diagram of the chord of it? Yes, but I was going to write the uh, other formula that solves double star first and then go back for examples. I hope that's all right. Um, so here's the solution for double star. And this is work with Marcus Hinn. And it looks like this. Make sure I don't mess it up. So what's changed? There's a weight, which I'm putting right here, and I'll write down what it is in a second. It's made out of binomial coefficients and another parameter. Um, there's a different notion of size, because I'm going to have chord diagrams that now the chords have positive integer weights, and I need to sum up the weights to get the size. Um, and the monomials, well, the weights of the chords are going to contribute which k, which primitive they came from. So again, it's, it looks a little bit more gross when you write it down, but it's not fundamentally so much more difficult. So there's still the term like this, and it's going to get the which k it is depends on the decoration of BC. That should say D of BC. So that's on the, the weight of, of the BC chord. And then the rest of these look very much like that, except it's going to look gross again when I write it down because it looks gross. OK, so what's going to happen? <laughs> you don't have to look at the details because you probably don't care. Um, so for each terminal chord, you take the um, you take this decoration, this weight, this positive integer weight from the larger of the two indices and then you still subtract the indices on the other side. And now all of these were corresponding to the chords that were not these special terminal chords. So instead of just collecting them all together I, I, um, in one F0, I'm going to have to write down different F0s for all the non-terminal chords. So C non-terminal. So then I'm going to get A, the weight here of the C, and then always 0. All right? So what is the, so D of a chord is a positive 
integer um, weight or decoration. This here is the sum, sum of decorations. And what is this? It is a product of binomial coefficients, and it looks like this. So now counting up to the number of chords, so every chord is contributing a term. Maybe I should just say C chord. C chord. What's going to happen? Well, there's going to be this, its little decoration there. This number S had better show up. Right? Where's S? S is not in here at all. Well, there it is. It goes right there, that S parameter from the actual original equation. This is the only place it shows up. And then there's a new, and I'm going to be terrible and probably never give you a proper definition of new in this whole story, but it will come back. So we'll return. We'll return. We'll return to new. Okay? But notice in the original case, this really is a specialization, a special case of this, because these binomial coefficients, if the weights are always one and s is always two, two minus two, it's just something choose itself, and those are always one. It's the big product of ones. All right? So this is kind of gross. I don't think really a lot of people are going to look at this equation and say, this equation is awesome. Um, but it has some nice features. Uh, in terms of it's really a sort of heavily decorated or a heavily, you know, a bizarrely uh, multivariate generating function for these core diagrams, either just rudely connected or a, a decorated type. Um, and so it's giving you a series solution for the Green's functions as this kind of expansion over core diagrams. And the other thing I really like about it is this you'd be forgiven for saying, oh, that's just some weird special case. But in fact, it's not. It's the same, almost the same story, um, even with a much more general problem up at the top. I think that's kind of interesting. All right. I better define some stuff, right, and give an example. Like, what the heck? What is all this? All right. So what do we need? Well, we need some. Rooted, chord rooted connected chord diagrams. So, rooted chord diagram. And I don't really care if you want to draw it sort of as a chord diagram, or if you'd rather draw it as a matching along a line. It's really going to be essentially the same thing. Because the root, I need a root and a order, and I'm always going to take the counterclockwise order, but that really just means a rooted, connected, a rooted chord diagram then really is just a matching of the integers 1 through 2n. All right? So which one of those you like better is sort of a matter of taste. So these are the same, just different representations. Um, all right, well, that's chord diagram. What about connected? Connected, well, the easiest way to make a reasonably rigorous definition is to say, let's make the intersection graph of the chord diagram, which is where I have a vertex for each chord, and the vertices are adjacent if the chords cross. OK, and if that happens, if that graph is connected, then the chord diagram is said to be connected. So connected if and only if uh, intersection graph is connected. All right, well, that's all right. Now, what about those weird terminal chords? Because so far, everything I've said is very standard. And if you looked up chord diagrams in the combinatorics literature or in other parts of mathematics where people use it, you would know all these definitions. But terminal chords, that's sort of weird. What the heck is up with that? And so what is a terminal chord? Well, if you, again, make this intersection graph, and then you say a terminal chord is a chord well, you don't even need the intersection graph, just in here. A terminal chord is a chord where nothing after it crosses it. All the things that cross it have to come before. All right, obviously that's not the formal definition, but you can go look up the formal definition if you care. That's what it really is. So for example, in this diagram, 
there's only one terminal cord. The only terminal cord is this guy. But if I put a little guy in there, that guy would also be terminal. Because although there are plenty of cords after it, none of them cross it. The only thing that crosses it comes before. All right? There can be more than one terminal. Yeah, there can be more than one terminal. The first cord can never be terminal except in the diagram with just a single cord. But other than that, everything else could be terminal. Uh, if you draw this cord diagram, which is a perfectly respectable cord diagram, then every cord other than the first one is terminal. And that's a unique diagram with every cord other than the first one terminal. OK. I need one last thing before I can actually write De, de, de define everything that's in the question there, and then actually tell you something new. Um, and that is, um, what are these? I mean, these, I'm treating them as numbers, right? They're showing up in formulas as if they're numbers. So I have to tell you what order I'm going to put on the chords. And I want to order the chords not by the obvious order, which would be one of the two possibilities induced by the counterclockwise order, but by the following order. What do you do? Root is the first one. And now if I remove the root, I'm going to get some connected components. So let C1, C2, uh, C, J be the connected components. On removing the root, And now I want to recursively order using the same ordering. Everything from C1 comes next, then everything from C2, and so on. Then, so all in C1 uh, recursively by this order, then all in C2, etc. All right, and that calls for an example. So here, the root comes first. Yay. OK, then there are two connected components. And there are colors. There's this connected component. And there's this connected component. So first, I have to order the yellow component. Orange, yellow, whatever. Uh, so I'm going to start by the same rule. I, again, I haven't written it completely rigorously, but the um, connected components also inherit roots. Um, just I will take the roots just counterclockwise. So here's the root of this orange component. So it's the next thing in the order. I would remove it, then I'm left with this little chunk. So this is three and this is four. And then this little guy only gets to be five. OK? So notice that in this particular example, it's different from the counterclockwise order. OK, and now I'm done uh, in terms of being able to define what I wanted to define. And then I'll tell you about new things after that. So and then, um, then so BC is the first terminal chord, is the index of the first terminal chord in this order. And the T's are the rest. And so T1, T2, TK, no, TL, I called it, um, indices in this order of all terminal chords. OK. Are there any questions about the definitions? I mean, this is already like the halftime punchline. It's done, right? Like we, we, we can solve these equations. But now I want to tell you something more interesting and a little bit newer about the solutions of these equations. Comments or questions first? OK. Who ever heard of a squeaky eraser? <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you about a bijection to rooted Bridges maps.
And this is work with Julien Boutrell, I have to spell it neatly, and Norm Seilberger. Um, the short version's already on the archive since last January, but the long version, it didn't get accepted to the, to the, to the uh, conference, and we had to write a long version anyway, so the long version will be out soon, soon. We're just finalizing the last bits of it. Uh, okay, but I'm not, everything I'm gonna tell you here is in the short version, so if you want to read more about this, you can go check out the short version. Um, because, You'd be forgiven for thinking this definition of terminal chords is a little bit weird. Did anyone feel that way? Did anyone look at that definition and say, that's kind of weird? Why did you define that that way like that? Well, why I defined it like that is because it worked. But maybe it's not really satisfying. It doesn't seem like it's really doing the right thing. Um, so there's a very nice bijection to rooted bridgeless maps. And I'm going to show you what that is. So um, I better tell you what a bridgeless map is in the sense of combinatorics. So map, or sometimes they're called combinatorial maps. What is it? Well, it's what the minimum information you need to put on a graph to capture the embedding of the graph in a, pl in, in a surface. So um, the idea is a graph embedded in a surface But it's sufficient then just to have the order information around each vertex. And so usually these are axiomatized by saying I have a set of half edges and then I have two permutations, one of which is the cycles around each vertex and one of which is the pairings, some involution that gives the pairings of the half edges into edges. All right? But so it's just a graph embedded in a surface um, and this is, um, only need to keep keep a cyclic order at each vertex. I'm sure lots of you have worked with them. They're very nice objects. And many graph theory definitions just carry over immediately. In particular, bridgeless means exactly what it means in graph theory. A bridge is an edge that if you uh, remove it, the graph disconnects, possibly just pulling off a single vertex or possibly disconnecting into two more non-trivial pieces. And that's the definition of bridgeless I want here. OK. But what happens? The point is. There's a bijection between um, rooted, connected chord diagrams and bridgeless connected maps. Well, it's not even so hard to see because this is one of these cases, they satisfy the same recurrence. And so if you have two classes of objects that satisfy the same recurrence and the same base case, then they have to be equinumerous, right? And the recurrence gives you a bijection. I mean, kind of a gross, so it's, not, it's not the pretty bijection, right? It's only defined recursively, but it's there. And then you can look at it in more detail and refine it and then you're happy. But I'm just, I'm just going to show you the, the, the common recurrence to show you that these are, in fact, classes in bijection. So, um, so because same recurrence, and furthermore, this recurrence is physically interesting because if you think back to this as a sort of generating function for chord diagrams, well, if you've got a recurrence for chord diagrams and these parameters are decent, it's also going to give you a functional equation of the generating function. And what is that functional equation of the generating function? If you interpret this, that's actually a Green's function in quantum field theory. It's the normalization group equation. So that's kind of cool. You know, that's a major important equation in physics. And it's telling you that there's this bijection, among other things. Same recurrence, which happens to be, or which is, is the renormalization group equation from the physics perspective, or from the QFT perspective, let's say. 
Oh wait, let me just draw you a picture to show you the bijection. And I want to keep that, so we'll write it on that one. I don't really need that one. Do you think it can do two things at once? No, it cannot. Oh no, don't keep going up. So here it is. OK, quick vote before I draw it. Do you like your chord diagrams as circles or on a line? Who likes them as circles? Who likes them on a line? <laughs> that was pretty close, actually. But I think circles won. It's on a line on my page, though, so we'll have to do it. Sorry? Yeah, well. OK, here is the recurrence. Yeah, I always do it both ways. Um, so I'll do, it on a, I'll do it on a circle. So here is uh, on chord diagrams, if this is the root chord, and then there's some chunk in here. Ooh, and I have colors. So I'll use colors in my chunks. Do that again. So here's one chunk. This could be more than one connected component once I've, like, the, the, I'm not saying that this is one connected component when I remove this root. It could be m many connected components. Um, good, so could be more than one. One component. But there'll be some component that's the last component. And that's going to go here. Okay, but this should be just one component. It's the last one. Uh, that's sort of the answer. Um, OK, fine. We'll write it that way. This, I can think of this as being here is a perfectly good rooted connected diagram. And here is another perfectly good rooted connected diagram with, so this is now rooted here. But it also has a piece of information, which is where this goes. So that's got to be marked with an arrow. And this is very classical. Um, uh, with a slight variation, um, there's a paper of Nienhuis and Wilf, and uh, it goes, it's before them, in fact. A very, very classical recursion for generating connected chord diagrams, rooted connected chord diagrams. Yeah, plus insertion. You could put an O. I don't care what notation you use. It's an operation. It has two arguments. But the thing on the right gets inserted. Yes, this right. thing goes in there. You have to know which way around to do it. Yeah, well, the picture tells you which way around to do it. The purple part is the purple part. It goes in there. OK, does that make sense? What, what can I do on the level of the maps? Well, the maps I'm going to have to write in two cases. So that's a little more annoying, but OK, fine. It's all right. Um, my maps, oh, I didn't say that. I'm going to actually have rooted maps. I should really say that. These are rooted bridgeless connected maps. And I want to think of the root as actually being like an external edge, OK? So here is my external edge, which is my root up here. And then it's going to go down to some sort of region, right? So, OK. So there's the rest of my map. Doesn't have to be planar or anything, it's just some map. Oh, no, wrong color scheme. Oh, this is the orange part. Orange. And 
Here I'm going to insert something, which should be purple. It's got its own route. It's got its own stuff down here. And furthermore, it has to have a marked vertex. And what am I going to do? Well, I will um, put, keep the orange thing here. Oh, I need to have one other thing. Where's my root cord? Where's my equivalent of this root cord? Well, I'm going to take the first cord. Remember, I've got a cyclic order at every vertex here. So I can take, there's a uniquely defined cord that comes out here. And two things could happen. Um, but as long as I've got at least one internal cord here, it goes somewhere into the rest of the diagram. And so that's what I'm going to use to link onto the purple thing. So I have this vertex, and that's where I'm going to put the purple guy on. And I've got that spot that was marked on the purple guy, and that's where I'm going to put that guy on. Okay, so I inserted it. And I didn't leave myself enough space because there is actually one other case. Um, because this, it, we, it's not easy to see what this should mean in the case where there's really just one vertex other than the, the, that little dangly guy. And the answer is it's not hard, but I've got to write it down. And what you do is, well, and put that purple thing in here. And I'm going to make a new first edge here that's going to hit hook on to the marked, um, the marked, it's really a marked corner, right? If you want to think about at each vertex, you've got the half edges coming in or out, however you want to think about it. And then you've got the little spaces between them, as you might say, the corners at each vertex. Those are clearly in bijection, but it's better to think of the corner, because really that's where you insert into some corner. Okay, so you look at this and you say, well, that's interesting. Um, but what I'm not going to tell you about today, and you can go look at the paper, you can go look at the full paper when we finally finish it, is this isn't just some exercise that you give to your, um, to your combinatorics class, because this bijection is actually really useful in the sense that a lot of good parameters carry through this bijection. Um, and maybe more useful parameters carry through this bijection than you might naively guess. Um, and so we at least found it a very useful bijection. Um, yeah, and I will tell you just a few things about how it's useful in my remaining minutes. Are there questions about uh, maps or this bijection before I do that? Oh, man. Right. To be turned something into something. It's the word that people use. I'm sure they have a reason, a historical reason, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. But, but in, yeah, don't think of map in the sense of function. I think it's map in the sense that, that a graph, like it's the map to graph. Like if you have an embedded graph, that's like a map, like four color map theorem, right? Um, and so it's a map in that sense, like a, a literal map of regions. All right. Wait, why is this useful? Why are you supposed to care? Other than because you're polite enough to listen to me. Well, so I want to make a few different points here. The first one I already said, but let's actually write it down. It gives a serious solution to some dyson tringer equations as a kind of generating function of chord diagrams, which honestly I think is kind of cool. And 
And notice, chord diagrams are nice objects. Um, you can immediately see from this recursive decomposition that you can have an algorithm to uniformly generate random chord diagrams. If you just use the decomposition, um, you will get a quadratic algorithm, a quadratic in the size of the diagram. But I mean, still, you can generate some pretty big chord diagrams quadratic in the size. That's not so bad. Um, and so then you can uniformly generate random chord diagrams. It's also suited to so-called Boltzmann generation, which some of you might know a little bit about, um, which means at the expense of only getting your size within a sort of a band of the size that you're trying to generate, you can actually linearly generate, and there's again, there's a couple caveats, but essentially linearly in the size of the diagram, you can randomly generate chord diagrams. Um, and you don't have precise control of the size you get out, but you do get that whatever size you get, you're getting, um, it'll be uniform within that size. So as you continually draw from this, a uh, random generator, you'll get a spread of sizes, but you're generating uniformly within whatever size you pick, whatever size you happen to pick. The different sizes are weighted a little differently, so it's not uniform over the band, but within each size in the band, it's uniform. Okay, so what does that mean? That means, all right, say you want to try to figure out something more empirically about these expansions of these Green's functions. Well, you could randomly generate uniform core, uniformly generate random chord diagrams of some given size, and notice size is the power of the coupling. So size is essentially your loop order. So you could randomly generate large chord diagrams, and then you could try to say something empirically about what sort of monomials is going to come up. Now, it's uniform in the chord diagrams, but the monomials mean they're weighted differently. So it's not uniform after you weight them, it's uniform before. All right, so that's not perfect. But still, there are some interesting things that you can learn empirically um, from that sort of an approach. All right, so that's fine. So I'll just write that down. Also, chord diagrams are well suited to random generation. What else? So where am I trying to get at with this random generation? Well, I mean, look, we're, I'm in a whole room where all you guys do resurgence, right? I mean, you don't, you don't really want that. That's just some series. You want to do something better with it, like sum it back up in some useful way with all this nice theory that you guys all have. Okay, well, I'm not actually gonna tell you anything about that, but a first step along the way, maybe I would like to know something about the asymptotics of these coefficients, right? I mean, you guys have been all about going beyond asymptotics, but maybe I can't go beyond asymptotics till I have some asymptotics. Let's do it one thing at a time here. Well, and again, the recursive structure means that this is well suited to using algebraic combinatorics techniques to look at the asymptotics. So uh, that was point number one. This is point number two, is well suited to um, algebraic combinatorics um, analysis of asymptotics. Um, and this is work with Julien again. Um, and well, he frankly did most of the work. Um, and this one, because that's his background is in, the, uh, in this stuff. Ooh, I'm getting chalk on there. Um, let me just, I don't have a lot of time left, so let me tell you briefly a few things. And again, if you want to see the details, I invite you to go look this up. But let me just tell you some of the kinds of things that you can just get out of basically analyzing the generating functions under these sorts of recursions. Um, you have to start to refine the, the generating functions to carry whatever parameter you're trying to analyze the distribution of. And of course, you would like to have a full distribution of terminal chords, but okay, we're not quite there yet. Maybe, maybe uh, well, we're, we're not there yet. <laughs> Someone needs to be more clever than we are, but there are definitely things that you can, you can find out. So let's talk about the number of adjacent, let's just talk about first the number of terminal chords. This is a theorem that it's Gaussian 
with mean and standard deviation, both of which are, um, are they exactly log n or are they just proportional log n? I'm going to say proportional to log n. I don't remember what the coefficients, what coefficients there might have been, but I think it might actually be on the nose. I don't quite remember. Um, so you get, you get a log n type thing. Now, you might also notice, so the number of terminal chords is pretty important in those formulas. But you also might say, look, I need the differences. So you might say, okay, what's the distribution of terminal chords that are adjacent? So I, I say number. This is really distribution. Distribution. You could also ask for the distribution of um, adjacent terminal chords. This is also Gaussian, but now you're going to get a log n over 2. So yeah, I think that is right on, because um, then that 2 is the coefficient there. So you get a log n, you get a log n over 2. So you see how much of all the terminal chords, you see then how many adjacent ones you're, you're looking for. Um, we also have, without the full distribution, you can see that the expected number, uh, sorry, the expected location of the first terminal chord, so the expected BC index of the first terminal chord is 2n over 3. So that's kind of interesting, actually. Yeah, so these are very interesting things, and you can use the asymptotics to do uh, experiments to find more things, and then you can try to prove them, and then, you know, it's a fun game. Uh, I want to along say two other things related to this, because I think this is very interesting, even though we don't have all the answers yet. Two minutes. OK. Um, so one thing that's uh, something that people like to do on the quantum field theory side is rearrange this expansion to look at the leading logs. That's when the power of x and the power of l are the same. And then the next to leading logs, where there's one more power of x than l, and next to next to leading log, and so on. And if you think about the combinatorics for a moment, you'll see that it's not surprising that that really makes things simpler. Um, well, basically, it's this sort of uh, when you're lucky enough to have a, like, you can move between the ordinary generating function and the exponential generating function is maybe the right way to say it. Anyway, it's much more well behaved if you're looking at the next to next or whatever leading log. And so uh, as another example, within this example, if you have a next to, you know, however many next to leading log, say there's k of these. This is asymptotically dominated, and I, I'll make, if you want the precise actual statement, there is a real theorem here, and if you want the precise statement, you can look in the paper. But this is asymptotically dominated by chord diagrams with exactly the last k chords terminal. And why is that important? Because if the terminal chords are precisely the last k of them, then I know exactly what that monomial is. It's an appropriate power of f0 and an appropriate power of f1. Sorry, this is just in the star case, not in the double star case. So sorry, this is in star. Um, we're look, I'm looking with Julien right now, not right now, but we are looking right now at doing the asymptotics for double star there. But this is just for star. So again, for star. And so that's really interesting. That's saying in this, in this case, there's really sort of two, two, the first two terms in the expansion. You've, you've restricted your physical situation enough that those first two terms are what's contributing predominantly. But that is because of how you're cutting it up. If you look at the full thing, all the other terms all play a, a non-trivial role. So it's, it's about how you're indexing it, too. Okay, and then just finally, one last tidbit about this is, so um, we're now looking um, at double star, and the main, the most exciting piece of news, so here's a tidbit, s equals 1, s equals 2 are different, and s greater than 2 
is all in the same, like there's really, it's a, it, there's three situations. There's S equals one, S equals two, and S greater than or equal to two. So there's three different situations. And that is, what's that saying physically? Look, S equals one is the insertion combinatorics for something like, like QED, S equals two, is like this Yukawa stuff that, that David and, and Dirk did ages and ages ago and that somehow I always keep mentioning because it's foundational to a lot of things I do. And then S equals two is, is more insertions as the thing grows. So, so not something that's really showing up in the, in the physical quantum field theories we like the most. So it's saying these ones are distinguished. The physical ones are really distinguished. And the very last thing I'm going to say, I'm just going to go here is, what about the bridgeless maps? I told you about those stupid bridgeless maps and I never did anything with them. Well, I told you the parameters are good. And so let me leave you with the very last point. Bridgeless maps clarify parameters. For example, what are the terminal chords? They're the vertices. Okay, now vertices, that is something natural and classical. And so that is a nice object as opposed to a terminal chord. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hope it's working. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, we have time for. Um, one or two very quick questions, yes. So in the context of quantum field theory, I think I understand S equals two as renormalizing a propagator and S equals one as renormalizing a vertex. And I think S greater than two are all the other things that you can do that you don't need to do because you have a, a renormalizable quantum field theory. You see, the idea is that in a quantum field theory, you're supposed to look at your Lagrangian and say, I have affinity for every term in a Lagrangian. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've looked at vertices and you've looked at, uh, yeah. at propagators and you know to distinguish them with S equals one and S equals two. Yeah, well, yeah. So this I think S greater it's... than two, is it something to do with all those things that you don't need to do in quantum field theory? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. Because you could also get an S greater than two situation. Well. Yeah, at least in four dimensions, I think, I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, just a remark. I don't think that uh, in uh, realistic quantum field theory you can just keep with a function uh, depending on only one variable. You are absolutely right. I've clearly really trivialized the kinematics and much less having you know, any masses or anything. Um, so yes, absolutely. We're, this is really just the single scale part, and that's only a very special part of what's going on in physics. But there's already a lot of interesting math. And at this moment, I would have to say I'm optimistic that the core diagrams are, are still an, a reasonable way to index the more general expansions. You can, you can set up the problem, um, but you know I need to get a good student on it. Uh, it's absolutely right. But all anomalous dimensions come from two-point functions with a single energy scale. So if you're just interested in the beta functions, the anomalous dimensions, the things which in statistical mechanics are the critical exponents, then you only need single scale diagrams. Yeah, and there's good stuff happening there, right? I mean, if you want to go beyond single scale, there's a lot of interesting things about the way all the angles relate, and I have not even touched that. And it's, I'm sure it's really interesting, and I'll think about it in the future. Okay, I'm afraid we have to close the discussion right now, so let's thank Karen again. Thank you.